All right, my name is Frank Sanders. Uh, I'm a student both at UNT and Colin College. I'm uh, currently working in the uh, cybersecurity degree program at Colin College. Uh, basically, I want to talk to you today about security keys. Uh, basically, you've been using them for ATMs for years, but uh, now we're taking it into the next step of using it on the internet. Basically, to understand the two-factor authentication, which is what you basically use in your ATMs, <laughs> is, is you're using two different pieces of information to try to verify who you are. Those basic pieces is something you are, something you have, something you do, and something you know. Uh, most places that you go to online, I'm sure everyone here uses email or has Facebook, LinkedIn, some other social connection that you go in. Go to your bank, all those use passwords. Basically your passwords is something you know. That's only one of the factors. A two-factor authentication adds in one of these other things to it. We've all heard about biometrics, you know, fingerprint scanners, stuff like that. That is basically something you are, something about your person, you know, retinal scanners, all that stuff. A little bit expensive still, but it's still getting there. Look at the new iPhone that came out. It's got a fingerprint reader on it now, help you unlock your phones. So you're trying to do two-factor authentication at that. It is actually becoming more and more mainstream. The something you do, uh, that's along the lines of how well, the speed that you type is something you do. It's a metric that you can do and see, you know, everyone types at about the same style because we know where our letters are on the keyboards. The only variations are the keyboard, when you're on a different keyboard, things may be a little bit different. But we all type at about the same pace for ourselves. I type faster than Matt may type, I might type faster than you type. It's all, you know, relative to the person. So that is, you know, something that you do. The something you have is something that we're all familiar with when you look at your ATM. As I said, you know, this is basically taking what we've been using for ATMs for years into the digital age. ATM, you go in, you put your card in, something you have. You type in your PIN, basically your password. We've all done it, we've all gone through and done that. That's the basic form of the two-factor authentication. Someone doesn't have your card, they can't get into the ATM. Therefore, they can't, even if they know your PIN. It's one of the reasons why they always tell you to watch your PIN when you're trying to do the ATM, because if they then, you know, get your card or clone your cards like that, it makes it easier. Uh, like I said, examples of these uh, multi-factor, the two-factor authentication, uh, the smart cards. Uh, this is, if some government groups nowadays have ID cards that have like an RFID chip or something in there. There's a piece of technology in there that has some data in there as well <coughs> as the card itself. And so, and so you have that card that you go in and you go to an, an entry and it scans it, lets you in, keeps, and it's all individual. You know, for instance, you know, basic minimal form of smart card. This is, you know, pass to get into the office. It basically just has a, a code that's tied to my name. As long as it's activated, I have it, I can get in. The thing being, though, is you have to use that along with something else to get that multi-factor authentication. Uh, tokens. Uh, how many people here play like MMOs and use the security keys? Uh, yeah. yeah. So basically, that is that is the most common form of token outside of the business place that people have. Uh, people put tokens on their phone for code generators, stuff like that. Basically, it will generate a number. You type that number in along with your password, and you'll get into your system. That's basically what the tokens are. Again, you've got your biometrics. Uh, when I was talking about this, something you do. Those are the behavioral biometrics. You've got your keystroke dynamics, how you type. You've got your voice recognition. We all speak in similar tones, similar inflections, speed, stuff like that. All of those can be used as a metric to try to give that extra authentication. Uh, computer footprinting is basically knowing the computer you're coming from. Uh, when you go to your banks, uh, some banks nowadays are doing the, do you trust this computer and all that stuff when you first log in. What they're doing is they're getting that footprint of the computer and going, okay, this is a trusted computer. We've got the MAC address for this computer. We will trust this computer to connect to our network because you told us to. Not the most, you know, efficient because someone else logs in and says, yeah, I want you to trust my computer too. It can end up going around it. But these are different things and you can see there's multiple ways you can go in there. Uh, to get that multi-factor authentication. We've all heard about passwords, how to keep track of them. Uh, basically, when your passwords, they're only as strong as their encryption. Uh, when I talk about the encryption, basically, when you look at most websites or anything else, 
when you type your password and save it, they have it saved in a encrypted file. Now, when you hear about all these places, LinkedIn getting hacked, you know, all this other stuff, many times what they go in is they try to grab this file. And if they can grab this password file, all they have to do is break that encryption and they have all your passwords. And the thing being is that encryption, there are some very strong encryptions out there. Not everyone uses the strongest encryption they can. I mean, some people want to do it for the ease sake, use the simplest one. Some of the others will use, you know, really hard ones. Uh, basically, in passwords, the people are the weakest link. The fact being is, as we've heard before, people like to use the same passwords. You don't like to have to remember a password for every site you go to. Uh, people have trouble remembering complex passwords. A lot of companies now have a minimal requirement. In fact, there's a setting in Windows that you can see here for the login for your computer require you to meet minimum complexity requirements. The minimum complexity requirements that they've set up is pretty much eight characters long, an uppercase, a lowercase, a number, and a symbol. Microsoft on Windows requires only three of those four, and that considers what they consider a strong password. Now, uh, the thing being is just to give you some information here, uh, how many seconds will it take to break your password? A six character uh, alphanumeric with no uppercase uh, password has 2.25 billion possible combinations. Cracking using a basic web app, hitting a target site, a thousand guesses per second, just takes 3.4 weeks to crack that password. That's using a web app. You have that file that I talked about them downloading. You have access to that. 0 0.0224 seconds to crack the password with today's technology. And this is from a report from 2011. Uh, cracking it offline, and basically that's using a high-powered servers and desktops. Uh, basically does 100 billion guesses per second. Uh, cracking it offline using massive parallel multi-crossing clusters. Uh, basically several computers tied together doing it. You basically take that, divide it by another thousand, and you're doing it in, you know, microseconds. And that's just with a six-character alphanumeric. You go to ten characters. Again, this is still alphanumeric. This is not putting in uppercase or symbols. There's 3.76 quadrillion possible combinations. Again, 3.7 weeks to do it online through web applications. 10.45 hours using high power computers. 37.61 seconds using a cluster of computers. Makes you think about those passwords you use these days on your systems, how fast and secure they can be. Even if you go in and put in a uh, symbol, you know, the exclamation part, something like that. It again does not add a whole lot to it. You're still looking at uh, 2.4 centuries to do it online with the system. <laughs> not many people are do, trying to do that. That's one of the things that, that's where people feel secure. If someone trying to brute force their way in, it's going to take forever. You get that file again, you're looking at 1.26 minutes, you know, not even 90 seconds to get it. And that's not even with, that's just with the single supercomputer. You cluster your computers, even with that symbol, you're looking at 0.07 seconds. Still, that's with the, you know, you put it up to 10 characters with that symbol. Online, you're looking at 54 million centuries. Not gonna happen. But you get the file, it then goes up to 54 years with a simple computer. You take it with the cluster of computers, you're looking at about 2.8 weeks. And again, that's only 10 characters. And like I said, Microsoft, when they set up their stuff on passwords, tell you to do it in a eight characters with those settings. So it's still not very secure. And you can see why passwords are the weakest link in that case. The other problem being is people write them down because they can't remember them. You start getting long, complex passwords. And as you can see, the longer, more complex it is, the harder it is to break. But then it's harder for you to remember as well. Uh, People do social engineering using password reset questions to sit here and get your passwords reset to something easier for them because they'll find out information about you. So again, basically the password by itself is weak. Uh, basically the technology has become uh, a lot more efficient on breaking this stuff down. Again, that report that I was reading from, this is the link for it. I've got a handout with it, this information as well. You can read the entire report about it. Uh, and that's still two years ago. Technology has jumped since that time. You can pretty much take some of those and half them.
in the time it's going to take to do it nowadays, or even more, as the technology has done. Also, the thing being is, how many data breaches have you heard about lately? Have you heard recently banks? Mm -hmm. You've had LinkedIn, you have Facebook. How many of you have actually had a friend who, say for instance on their Facebook, starts posting weird stuff that you go, this isn't something they're gonna post. Mm -hmm. You sit here and what's the first thing you tell them? You've been hacked. Yep. Yeah. And it's because they only had a simple password, someone guessed it, usually based on the social engineering, they didn't actually have to do a whole lot more because of all the information that was shared. They have it only set up with just a password. Thing is, once you get that password, you're in. That's all it takes. You get into one, usually you can get into the others, or use that to start getting the other ones. Uh, you've had actually reporters who actually write for computer magazines who had someone hack into one of their accounts. Through using that, they were able to get into a bunch of their other accounts, resetting passwords along the ways, and basically taking over his entire social network that he's on. So basically what we have here is the multi-factor authentication. This is where we take your password and add something else to it. Right now, we've got several companies that are large that have started doing this. Uh, basically, you've got Google, Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, even some banks are starting to use it, and the government. What they're starting to do is requiring you to do this multi-factor authentication. What I want to show you in just a minute is actually an example. I've got uh, Google, for instance, as I'm going to show you how you can use the multi-factor authentication for Google. Uh, Basically, before I explain the stuff on Google, these are the links, again, this is going to be the handout I give to you, of the big four that are using multi-factor authentication now. These are the uh, write-ups they have on how to do it. I've actually printed off these as well, and we'll hand those to you so you can take them with you and set up yourself later, because, like I said, this is something you probably need to do to protect yourself, because we all rely on our passwords more than anything else as our safety for online. Uh, Basically, you've got uh, more and more companies are starting to go into this multi-factor approach. Uh, they're doing it for their employees through the security tokens at work. Uh, a lot of people have these RSA tokens that they use uh, instead of having the uh, smart card you can do it on computers, where you put the card in the computer and type the password or else the computer won't turn on, stuff like that. That's all part of this multi-factor to prevent this stuff. So if someone steals the computer, they can have a password, crack the password, but if they don't have that card, you can't get into anything. I mean, you can pull the hard drive out and do something, but that's a lot more work than the common criminal is going to try to do if they can just get a password and get in. Uh, basically, every week you're going to hear another story coming out of some company somewhere that's had their data breached. Customer information files are taken. That's used to sit here now that you've got a username. They go, your password's safe. They never got the password. They've got your username, they've got your address. They can then do social media searches for you and find out your information, try to reset your password now that they have the username, or try common passwords, or you know the brute force stuff that I was talking about. And if you have a weak password, that's how the breaches happen. Now, what I've got here now is a couple of handouts to give to y'all. And what I want to show you, uh, Basically, I've got, since there's actually several printouts I have here, I have little folders for you with the information. Included in there is the presentation, as well as the uh, printouts for the various uh, sites that I've talked about. Now, what I'm going to show you as an example on here is for Google with their Gmail. Uh, what I'm going to do is, basically, I set this up ahead of time to where... I'm actually going to use my work account, so you can see here. But uh, the reason is I've already set this up with the two-factor authentication. <coughs> so even though you're going to get some of the information about me, you're not going to be able to get in here if I don't let you get my phone. Just a second. I actually have a uh, large password on my phone as well because I hate don't want people getting into my phone and doing stuff like that. So basically, we've got here, and then I think that's the password I have here. First of all, I never check to stay, stay signed on. Uh, hey, look, I can't remember my own password.
I clicked on the button, I saw that, because I use so many different passwords for things. All right, since that one's not going to work for me, because I don't want to lock my work account, we're just going to go to one that I know I would, no, I don't do it. I'm just going to do a regular one. Like I said, I use a lot of different passwords. I don't actually have a password uh, saving program like has been talked about by others. So I just have to remember which ones I have them set up for. All right, since I have set up the two-step verification, someone has got my password. They try to log into my computer. They'll get this screen here. Now, at this point they know, look, a message has been sent to a phone number with that. You may have heard my phone just chiming at me, saying I just got a text message. Basically, I go in here on my phone, and what I do is I have a message here from Google that will tell me your Google verification code, and what I have to do is I type in that code. Pardon me, getting old, I've got to have glasses. That could be where my problem was. All right. Okay, if you also notice here, there's this box here that says, don't ask codes again for this computer. Now, if it's your home computer and you're the only one who uses it, that's okay to do. Uh, Google will have a verification that you have to reset it every so often it'll ask you for the code again, just so you can't set it and be done for it. Now. I leave that unchecked because I don't want to leave it on this computer. Verify. All right, it now has me signed in. It sits here and says I can sign into Chrome, do a bunch of other stuff. But now at this point, I just skip through and eventually we will load up to my email. Uh, we don't need to see what's in my email box. But that's basically what the two-factor authentication does. And in your handouts that I gave you, there's actually a printout that I made that is a step-by-step -step guide for how to set up your Google uh, two-step verification. Facebook has very similar, uh, any of you who have a smartphone uh, and use Facebook, you can go through and set up Facebook to where it has a code generator built into the app on your phone. And what it will do is anytime you try to log into Facebook from another device, it will ask you for that code. Now, you know, who here's actually gone and used like a public Wi-Fi spot and stuff like that, or has gone through and done a, uh, you know, gone to Barnes and Nobles to get read and, and do stuff like that. I mean, we've all done it. The, uh, the thing being is you don't want to trust some of those computers. You don't want to trust stuff on those Wi-Fis. That's why you use this two-factor authentication because there are people out there who can sniff packets, get those passwords, they get your password, you got the two-factor authentication. That code that I just used, even though you saw that code, if you were to try to go in and log into my account on a computer right now with that code, it would not work. It code constantly changes. Uh, they've actually got on the two-factor authentication for uh, the Google, a, uh, and it's also with Facebook and other ones, because if you don't have a phone that is a smartphone that you can text messages, Google will call you. You can give them a phone number. They will call you and give you that code. And then you can type that code in and do it. And then they also have a way, and for security purposes, when you first set this up, there's going to be a, a thing that has a bunch of numbers that are emergency authorization codes. Basically, if you're offline, don't have your phone, need to get into your account, there's a group of 10 codes that they usually generate that you can use. When they first set up your two-factor authentication on any of these things and it has those codes there, first thing you do, do a reset after you turn on two-factor authentication. Just because if someone else has been into your account, they could have downloaded those codes, you reset those codes, those previous codes that they may have got are no longer valid. Uh, so basically, like I said, you can go through and do this for all your social sites that are out there these days. Uh, Twitter does it, Facebook does it, even Dropbox, I think, is added to recently. Uh, the idea being is with this two-factor authentication, the weakness of the passwords is nullified. Nothing's 100% secure. You're never going to get that 100% security. The key is to make it hard for someone to do it. And we all have phones. We all carry the phones with us. So that's, that's the way that a lot of people are trying to do this stuff. 
So do you have any questions about the two-factor authentication? I have two. Okay. Um, for purposes of things like smartphones and iPads, how does the two-factor authentication work with that when you're changing from, say, a Wi-Fi location back to your home and you're trying to open up your email app? Basically, in Google, actually, on the uh, thing, there's a setting for using apps on your smartphones because they don't do a lot of the two-factor authentication. There's a special setting you have to do for a lot of those to set up a device. Okay. Uh, to, to tell you the story, the reason why I got into the two-factor authentication is I logged in on the school's network at Collin College one time with my personal account, was checking my email. A day later, I got a notice from Google that someone in China had tried to access my account and Google had locked my account. I then looked in, you can actually see in Google, and it actually shows you where you've logged, in, logged into, where your account's been accessed from by IP address. I looked in there and saw someone who tried to log into my account five times from China before Google noticed it and locked it. If Google hadn't noticed it, they would have been in my account. After that point, first of all, I don't log into my email on the school network anymore because I don't know what someone's put on those computers. I don't trust them anymore. The other thing is I turn on the two-factor authentication. I've had two attempts on my account since then. They weren't at the same time. They did it once, said, I'm not trying this, moved on to someone else's account. Just having that on there and they get that code, basically most people sit there saying it's not worth it. You've got that six-digit code or eight-digit code. You now have to have not only break the password, you've got to break that code. And that code is a one-time code. You can try the code. Once you get in, that code changes. The code changes with time. Facebook's code, every 30 seconds on the app for the code generator, it will change the code. So when you go into your Facebook app and you're doing that, watch the little circle timer on it. You go through and watch it. If you're going to be slow typing it in, wait till it gets back to the 30 seconds and then type it in. Because if you're typing in and when it's got five seconds and you type it in, if that last one hit enter and it switched over to the next one, that code's no longer valid. It's basically designed to change at a regular interval that the system knows, but doesn't follow something that is easily trackable by someone else. Basically, that's how they try to do that. Like I said, on the, the Google actually in the document I gave you has a thing on how to set up your phone. Facebook has ways you can do it as well. Uh, you set it pretty much on your computer at first. Uh, I know Google sits here and resets your trusted computers every 30 days, I believe, and so you have to redo the code at that point. So even if someone does happen to do it or you do log on to something and someone you forgot to check that check off, you also have under the management console, which is in the document as well, will show you what devices you've authorized. And you can go in there at one point and go, I don't want any devices authorized. And it basically resets all of those addresses, so everything will have to then do it. And that's something that a lot of these two-factor authentications are doing to try to protect your devices and your information. Makes sense. Anything else? All right. Like I said, there's uh, copies of various ways to do it for both Facebook and Google and Microsoft. And Twitter, I believe, is all in there, along with copies of the slides with those links if you want to actually follow the links and go as well. Thank you.